How are you enjoying the conference so far? Fifteen hundred people. Atlanta showed up. So when we were together in Washington, D.C., or just outside Washington, D.C., if we tell the truth, we, we determined um, that we wanted to have a larger town hall meeting about the intersection of Black Lives Matter and drug policy. Because although we talked about it in separate silos, we often didn't talk about it together. And if you're going to be a movement, you've got to be willing to have what Patrice Con Colors taught me to have, which is courageous conversations. You've got to be willing to do them. You've got to be willing to say the truth. You've got to be willing to be authentic. And that doesn't mean being disrespectful, but it does mean standing in your truth and owning that space. Michelle Alexander set the bar high on that yesterday. And she asked us to go big. And that's what we're going to try to do tonight. Because what we know for sure is that it's not enough just to talk about changing policy when there are still people who will never recover from the policies that were created before to begin with. That's the conversation we want to have. What's the nexus? And what do we do as a movement? What's our position? We've never really had that talk. What are our values? What do we stand for? When we started this movement in 1994, not me, I was too young, and that's real. Don't laugh at that, because I really was. I really was. I'd only been married twice at that point. Real. You know, the values were driven by what we knew then, which was a lot about personal sovereignty, which is something everyone in this room can and should appreciate. The right, as Dorsey Nunn would say, to own me. The right for the government to not impinge upon my body. But also at that time, Bill Clinton, a Democrat, ushered forward an omnibus crime bill. I love Tony New. He stayed with the boo in the right moment. And that was a bill that challenged us to not just consider our liberties as individuals, but who we were as a society. Many of us who lived the real world consequences of the Effective Death Penalty Act is what it was called, right, Ira? My family was harmed underneath it. Couldn't speak in 1994. We were struggling, we were drowning. We were happy to have a bone thrown to us. But this is 2017, and many of the people who were harmed are now in the leadership of this movement. And it means we've got to begin to ask different questions, deeper questions, sometimes harder questions, but maybe not as hard as we think we are. And maybe we can do, as Malcolm X used to instruct, be reasonable people who walk in reason together. And so tonight, co-hosted by Afropunk, this conversation is being live streamed to literally hundreds of thousands of people about the case for reparations in our movement. We've lived with more than 50 years of the drug war, more than 50 years of mass incarceration and criminalization. And what does America owe us? What does it owe the world? I was in a gathering earlier today talking with people from all around the world, and the one thing that was consistent in that group 
was that even in places where race was not a factor, right, in Kenya or in the Philippines, what was consistent was the targeting of marginalized people by police. And it brought me back to a book that Ethan wrote, Cops Across Borders. And part of what the United States has done has not only exported a drug war in a blanket sense of you know, policies, right? But a way of policing people, a way of surveilling people, a way of deciding who matters and who doesn't matter. And so we want to have this conversation considering that too. What does America owe the world? What does she owe the world? We know America ships out all of this stuff. And usually we only talk about hip hop when we talk about what America ships out, our culture. But we ship out also the worst ways to treat human beings. And there's something that has to be held to account for that. And that's the conversation we want to have with you tonight. Are you ready? I'm going to tell you like I told you at the point in reception, must not be no Brooklynites in this house, because Brooklyn ready for this conversation. So if you ready, let me hear you say you ready. Come on, Ira. Show them how Brooklyn does. The original. Come on, Ira. Let them know. So to have this conversation is some of the most brilliant people I know that I have met uh, from long time and people I've met from short time, but sometimes even that short time is a lifetime in terms of the quality of the relationship. And so I'm gonna ask you to join me in welcoming this extraordinarily distinguished panel to have this, this discussion. And I'll say to you that as you know with me, I think that um, you know we wanna have the conversation up here, but to the maximum extent possible, we also wanna have it with all of, all of you. And so at a certain point, time allowing, I'm gonna also try to come in the audience and get as many of your questions and hear from official responders. Dr. Ron Daniels is in the house and has been pushing the question on reparations and the state of, from the first state of the war before that. My mentor from 1990, when we were at BMCC College together doing the Malcolm X conference and pushing it then. It's a question that's been around for a long time. And so he's here. So we want to hear from you as well. How do we do this? This is our way of being a movement. We call this the International Drug Policy Reform Movement. We have many partners who put together this movement. But DPA is still the largest organization. And what that means is not just to say that to funders. What that means is that we are accountable to more than just our board, accountable to more than just our staff. We're accountable to all people who are here, all people who are harmed by the drug war. And so we invite you into this conversation as we figure out how to do this work right. So please join me in welcoming to this stage <laughs> people I've just known for so long who I meet on many paths in my life because you know we're gonna take any paths to get free. And this is a woman I have just loved, adored, learned from, and so will you. Please welcome the co-founder of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference and its General Secretary, Dr. Ivor Carruthers. A newer friend, um, but no less, uh, meaningful to me is a brilliant woman from Panama who I met at a panel who talked about what it felt like to live in exile while not actually being exiled but because of what the United States had done and the decisions that it had made and Panama forced her family to leave the country and so much of that was tied to the drug war. How many people remember Noriega and how we treated Panama? 
and we don't talk about it anymore. And because it's not in the news, it doesn't be, be in our consciousness, but it is in the consciousness of the Panamanians who are there and here. One of them is with us tonight. She's a United States, a United Nations and human rights strategist. She is the leader of Four Americas Consulting. Please welcome jean vierre williams Comrie. jean have asked me where you want me to sit like she ever listens to me. That's some fake shit right there. The next two women I'm going to um, introduce, I sort of want to uh, introduce them together because there's a descriptor that I, I use um, for both of them and it's, it's true for both of them. So I'll, the thing that I love about these two um, young women in my life is that they made me braver. There is something true about, you know, getting a little bit older and a little tired and having private school bills to pay and all this sort of thing that just says, I'm gonna do good, I'm not gonna really harm, but I'm also not gonna push it too much. Because, you know, I've learned sometimes by pushing it, I get punched in the face. And then you meet some obnoxious ass young people <laughs> who never, who never, let you dial it in, who always push you to be the best version of yourself, which is to say, push you to tell you the truth. The first person who fits that description is the state director of the New York Drug Policy Alliance office. That's the one, Cassandra Frederick. And the second person I met in 2011 in Denver, just before marijuana was legalized in Denver. Art, were you here? I'm here. Well, you know a black man led that campaign to legalize marijuana. Let me just recognize Art Ray. We were doing this partner meeting, and it just, we weren't doing it right. We weren't doing it right. We were asking the wrong questions. We were making the wrong demands. And everyone knew it. The attitudes were off in the room. I knew it. And there was one young woman, I, I will tell this story till the day I, I know she's sick of it, I don't care. That's a mama privilege. But she said, you have to stop. This isn't how it goes. I just put my father in the ground because of this damn drug war, and we're gonna talk about this differently. She was the newest partner in our room, and she was probably the youngest partner in that room, but she was so, not just convicted, but she was right. So we changed the meeting in that moment, and we began to build a friendship. And on July 13th, which is also my birthday, in 2013, when I came home from my dinner with my daughter, and we heard that George Zimmerman had been acquitted. She said, y'all could get mad on Facebook. I'm going to do something. And along with two other women, Opalayo Tometi and Alicia Garza, say their names, they started a movement called Black Lives Matter. And so, the founder of a movement that's now become a global network that continues to call people together, and now the author of a book called When They Call You a Terrorist, the Black Lives Matter memoir that will be out on January 16th, 2018, and some sucker trying to sell it on eBay already. I can't even believe it. Welcome Patrice Kong Collars. And I pick on him because it's my right to. I'm going to do what I want. Look, I look at Ira and Kenny trying to figure out which one of them get on my nerves more. 
You see them over there conferring? Oh, Kenny, you said you was going to be the best at everything, so I'm going to give you that award. The thing about Kenny, and, and you know, I may repeat some of this tomorrow, you know, in all seriousness, that like other folks who were here and without going into his personal bio, you know, he wasn't meant to be here. You weren't meant to know his name. Wasn't meant to sit on a panel, wasn't meant to be called a pastor. There was an entire society that had decided his black life didn't matter. I'm trying to think of the courage it takes to stand up anyway and push th through that. But he did, and from prison, created an organization called the Ordinary People Society that every single day feeds 300 people in three different states, that politically educates them, that has changed the laws across the state of Alabama, the only state in the United States where people can actually vote from prison and from jail. That's what he did. This year took that law even harder and another 200,000 people can vote from in prison. Join me in welcoming my friend and personal, what is that called? <laughs> agitator, I was gonna say nuisance, but, but uh, we'll take agitator, that's Pastor Kenny Glasgow. You know, when I, was a, when I was a girl growing up in the 1970s and after the Black Power Movement, people used to say, um, well, white people used to say, <laughs> they were proud because they had a cocktail party and every cocktail party had a black person. Well, this is my cocktail party. My cocktail party got a white person. <laughs> From the moment, really, I think a week into my tenure at DPA in 2005, somebody who's like actually as loud as I am and talks as much as I do walked in. He's like, Who's this? Started talking to me about Frederick Douglass, started talking to me about mostly hope. And I was like, I want to be on that rainbow, right? When you're facing some of the most horrible things, and every day you're still going to get up, you're going to have conviction, and you're going to do it with love and with hope. And over the course of 13 years at DPA, when I've struggled, when I've been angry, when I've wanted to walk away, it was often the president of our board, which is rare, who I called to talk me off a ledge at midnight and at noon, and so it wasn't midnight and at noon, in Connecticut or in New York, to have those conversations, to go deeper. He led us through a transition period that we wondered how we would get through seamlessly. We just kept dragging him out. He's like, I'm retired, 21 years. I left the ACLU, I really meant I was retired. We are like, not today, homie, not today. <laughs> and so I am honored and moved to introduce to you my first mentor at the Drug Policy Alliance, Ira Glasser. Oh, oh, so we're about to do this. Yeah. And everybody have water? I get cotton mouth up in these ways. It's so cold, you wouldn't think you would, but I do. So, you know, let me just begin straight away uh, with you, Ira. Why not? <laughs> no. And you know, when, when we talk about reparations, it's often a conversation that's had only um, among black people, and white people won't have the talk. Can you talk a little bit about the fear that exists among white people around even just the word reparations, just the very word when it relates to this country, because we, we do embrace it elsewhere. 
And then Dr. Iva, I want to bring you into the conversation to talk a little bit about the history of this movement and what it means and where it might fit within a drug policy context. But I want us to, to I want us just to work through that fear before we do anything else. Well, you know, I, uh, I spend most of my time that I talk about this issue talking to white liberal friends who uh, regard themselves as part of the civil rights movement and as supportive of it and as the very opposite of the kind of uh, wave of white nationalist racism that we're seeing in the country now. And those people are very unsympathetic, well, more than unsympathetic. They, you start talking about repairing the damages, um, and I use that phrase because I found more success with it than in the word reparations for some reason. And they get defensive, they get angry, um, they feel as if they're being accused of being responsible for a problem that they don't feel responsible for. And uh, it's one of the hardest, I mean, I went through this in talking about affirmative action with white liberal audiences for decades, uh, but this is much, much harder. I'm not exactly sure why, but I do know that they don't know any history. I do know that they don't, in fact, have any problem with the concept of repairing damage, uh, whether or not you're responsible for it, whether or not you intended it. If they hit somebody in the street with a car by accident, without any intention to do so, they would not feel that it was inappropriate for that person to get compensatory damages. They would not leave that person with a broken leg on the street and say, oh, well, just because I didn't run over you again, uh, you can get up and walk away and I'll drive on. Um, they know that. Um, many of them grew up as the children of a generation that uh, benefited from something in this country that almost nobody thinks about anymore called the GI Bill of Rights. Mm. The GI Bill of Rights was the biggest program this country has ever passed for reparations. They didn't call it reparations, they called it rights. And what the GI Bill of Rights was, uh, was, was a program that decided that, well, you know, we took this whole group of people off the track of opportunity. We took them out of the mainstream and had them fight a war for us for three or four years. And so now we're, we have an obligation to make them whole because they come back and they're at a disadvantage. They're behind. They're at a disadvantage with jobs. They're at a disadvantage with education. They're at a disadvantage with money. They're at a disadvantage in every way. And I think a country which thought it was morally obligated to make amends for people who took, were taken out of the race for a few years has trouble thinking about making amends for what we did with, with the war on drugs. And remember that the war on drugs is just the latest instrument of subjugation. That we're talking really about a history of 300 years and there's no way to talk about repairing the damage without talking about all of that. Mm. Mm. And, 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 and most people don't know. Certainly I know my children don't know. I talk to them all the time. My grandchildren don't know. When you get to be this age, you get to be a historian because you find out when you start talking about things, nobody knows anything. <laughs> <laughs> They're not coming from the same place you're coming from and they don't share the same premises because they don't share the same facts. People don't know that what the GI Bill of Rights did is it provided tuition for college, high school, vocational training schools. It provided living expenses while people were going to school. It provided low-cost loans without a down payment, low-cost mortgages without a down payment for people to buy homes when they came back from the war. It provided low-cost loans to start businesses, credit to start business to people who had no assets. 
And it didn't do that with a means test, though they debated that at the time in the legislation. They did it for everybody. Because everybody suffered the disadvantage, everybody was going to get the repair. Mm -hmm. And they didn't do it just for people who were in combat. They did it for people who were on active duty for 90 days or more. 90 days. And you compare what that repair was targeting with what we're talking about, and you, you have to conclude if there was a moral obligation to pass the, bill of, the GI Bill of Rights, that moral obligation is multiplied by a factor of a 1,000 mm -hmm. for the people that we're talking about. And that case has never been made to the white liberal audience who thinks they're with us. They don't know about it. You have to get past their sense of defensiveness. They feel like you're accusing them of racism when you tell them they have a moral obligation. And they wouldn't feel that way if they were debating the GI Bill of Rights. And they wouldn't feel that way if they had an accident and hit somebody by accident with their car. The idea of repairing damage that the state and official policy and law has done is not an alien concept. It's, it's, it's established in our country, it's established in our culture, it's established in our law. So you have to ask yourself, why is it so received so radically and crazy in this context? And the answer has to be rooted in the same way that the, every answer is rooted in this country. Uh, it's different when you're talking about people of darker skin color. So, one, one more thing I want to say. The GI Bill of Rights, because this is a very important part of the GI Bill of Rights, in order to get it passed, they needed the votes of Southern Democrats. This is 1945, 46. And in order to get it passed, part of the way it was passed is that the law required that the federal government would fund this but it was going to be administered locally. Mm. So local white folks got to decide who got these benefits. Right. So there were 67,000 mortgages enabled by the GI Bill of Rights in the first year after it was passed, and fewer than 100 went to people who were not white. There were 100,000 people in the first year, uh, black people, who applied for the education benefits. Fewer than 20% of them got it. So looking at the GI Bill of Rights, you, you get a rationale for what we're trying to move toward and think about that is very powerful and compelling. But at the same time, the way in which the GI Bill of Rights was administered and played out describes the problem that we have even with the audience of white liberal people who we think should be with us. And we need to find a way to transfer that sense of moral obligation to them, even if they were not racist. Thank you, Ira. Thank you so much. I didn't, you know what, Patrice, you and I talked about the GI Bill relative to your father. I didn't know those numbers. I didn't know those numbers. That was, that was incredible. And, and Dr. Ivor, I, want, I do want to bring you into this conversation to think about, as we are doing this work, um, about uh, repairing the harm. And there is all kinds of fear from primarily white people, although some black people too won't have the conversation, you know, if we're going to be completely honest. I wonder how we do it rooted in the history, in the original history, in the telling the truth of the history of reparations, where that movement comes from, because here we're going to be talking primarily about black and brown people. And I, I want us to know how to do this work right within that context. I want us to, um, Think about the lessons you've learned and what, what we, the pitfalls we can avoid in engaging this work. And does it make sense to pull it apart and think about the drug war and mass criminalization and incarceration as one piece of it? It's sort of you know, what was done in your city in Chicago. 
So thank you. I am very pleased to be here and honored to be here. And Ira, I listen to you intently. I stopped counting the number of times you use the word people. And I think that's the operative word. That in fact, um, people of African descent were not considered people. And so it becomes very easy in the psychic and in the privilege of white people to not think of people of color and particularly black people as deserving because we are still not considered human. And so the whole notion of what it means to be human um, comes center stage in the context of us having to confront the reality of the consequences of racism and white supremacy and what it has done in the world in a global context in which indeed there is a belief in a hierarchy of human value and black people, people of African descent have been at the bottom. I want to go back and just start with my personal narrative because you brought up some feelings in me that happens when you start telling your different narratives. My father was a Tuskegee Airman mm. and I was born while he was overseas. And when he came back, he was one of those veterans who was denied. Mm. And so it begins very personal for me and this happens over and over and over again of people of African descent where the reality that we have to confront as we walk in our daily lives forces us to deal with the consequences of what it means to live in a society in which there are a few who think they are more entitled by the color of their skin. I want to honor the memory and the work of Callie House, who is considered to be the mother, mother of the movement and Queen Mother Moore, who is another mother of the movement. I want to honor the work of Reverend Dickerson who worked with Callie House. And I want to honor my uncle, my great uncle, who expatriated to Brazil in quest for a different world in 1913. And so the point I'm really making is that from the first snatch, I think the people of African descent snatched from their communities in which there was a different worldview about what it meant to be human. When they were snatched, the movement for reparations began. Mm. The call and the claim for reparations began. And so when we think about how we begin this conversation, I think there's some assumptions that it is going to be a very difficult conversation. You've spoken to that. But what it's going to require is some truth telling and the courage and the capacity for people to sit and tell the truth and share one another's truths in a way that will allow us to come on the other side with a dismantling of a basic belief in this hierarchy of human value that some people have more value than others. Two weeks ago, I was in Geneva and I was there because the World Council of Churches actually has reparations on the agenda. And so I want it to be known that there are pockets of people who are trying to begin this hard conversation. But not only was the conversation of reparations on that agenda, but the overarching call was the call of Afrophobia. Mm. Mm. And Say that so again. the conversation was on Afrophobia and xenophobia as it related to where we are at the decade of people of African descent and what it means for the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights to at least engage a conversation on what is happening in the United States relative to African people. And when I think about Afrophobia, I think about the 
demand for us in this context to first of all claim, as you have claimed, that we've got to move from a paradigm of mass incarceration to one of mass criminalization. Mm -hmm. And once we do that, we are clearly then in a state where we have to interrogate what it means to be at this point in time in which black people, the state of being black is criminalized. And so it doesn't matter who you are, where you are. If you're the president of the United States, your acts are criminalized and de-gutted. If you are Black Lives Matter, your movement is criminalized. If you are an eight-year-old child, your white peers can lynch you mm -hmm. and fail. But they did attempt to lynch you. In Rhode, I in Rhode Island. So this history is a history of contestation. It's a history of claim. It's a history that said, ain't I your brother? Ain't I your sister? It's a history that said, I am a man, and black is beautiful. And it's a history that said, black lives matter. Mm. And so I think that there are the historical roots that we're standing on, some of which I've named. But there's real opportunity, too, and we'll come to that conversation, I'm sure, when we start talking about the role that John Conyers, in particular, has played. Say his name. Say yes. it one more time. John Conyers. Representing. Representing. Now, now, if, I, John now if I don't represent Brooklyn, there's only one other city <laughs> that I'm going to represent, and that is the great John Conyers. From from Detroit. Detroit. Come on. Motor City, Detroit. And the role he has played in carrying in his belly our claim, a claim that began on the shores of Africa. Thank you so much, Dr. Iva. Thank you. I want to appreciate Dr. Iva and Iva Glasser for giving us some history and context for this, and we're going to continue to, um, to pull that apart when we, when we have to. But, you know, for the, for the moment right now, I, I want to bring Kenny and Patrice into um, the conversation and really begin to ask each of you, you know, what reparations um, might look like. Let me begin with you, Patrice. Um, we've just uh, had the most you know, sort of intense process um, co-authoring your book, your memoir, um, which we realized, you know, at a certain point was the me less the memoir of Black Lives Matter than the story of what it meant to grow up with a target on your back from the day you were born, living at the epicenter of the drug war and the war on gangs in Van Nuys, California. And I wonder what the reparations could possibly be to you who watched the world move purposely against your father, your brother, your mother. And that's all before you became an activist. A world who decided everybody you loved didn't matter. What could possibly reparations look like for you? I'm tired, so that means I'm going to be like super emotional. I'm like tearing up already. Me too. <laughs> your baby's all right. um, well, I want to just. I think that's an important question, and I want to back up a little bit because I, I want. I, I feel like I always want to remind people what it, having this conversation under this current context and what it means right now. Um, I think it's easy when you come in a conference setting to sort of like slip into the habit energy of like, we're going to workshops, we're gonna listen to a plenary. But this to me is a, um, always, and the conversation about reparations is a, is a historical moment. Um, and I just want to like let that sink in a little bit. Um, when uh, peoples who have been um, systematically targeted 
uh, for their own demise, um, call for reparations, call for, um, a, a, which is super simple, right? A call for um, repair uh, because of harm that has been caused for centuries. Um, and yet the response to those people are guns, more law enforcement, militarization, um, laws that purposefully rip our families apart. Um, it's, it's just this, there's these moments where I get to sit in these places and Asha, you're often the one curating these spaces to have uh, a much more deep and profound conversation about what's gonna get us there. Um, and I just, I want folks to just sit in that because um, I think it's important. Um, but I, I think a lot about um, growing up during that time, I had the gift of writing a memoir with Asha and writing my memoir with Asha. And um, for those of us who grew up in these places and still live in these places that are um, uh, really uh, places that have uh, challenged black people's humanity, uh, we're just surviving, right? We're living. It's like if we were to just, if we were to actually sit and feel all the pain that we've experienced, we probably wouldn't survive it. So we have to keep living. And so, for me, um, I don't believe this country can ever repair what it's done to us. Mm. I don't. But what I do think it can do is reckon. Is reckon. Um, and that's what it refuses to do all of the time. Mm. Um, instead of reckoning its harm, it causes more harm, right? When people decide they're going to grieve, uh, when people decide they're gonna host vigil, uh, instead of honoring that, we are met with rubber bullets and tear mm. gas. And so there's something for me in this um, country's, um, dare I say, spiritual energy. Um, uh, there's something that's bigger than laws, um, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's policy can't fix. There's a sickness here, mm -hmm. and we must reckon with the sickness. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can reckon with the sickness, we can call for reparations. But if we don't reckon with the sickness and we have something like reparations, it's going to fail. And so part of the, the, the writing and, and processing what I witnessed as a child and what I continue to witness um, is literally, I remember writing an email after my brother had been released from um, state prison. He was released in the middle of a manic episode. Nobody told us. Nobody told us. And um, as he spent the next several days literally deteriorating in front of us and we had no idea what to do, I had this moment where I was like, oh, they literally don't give a fuck about us. Mm. And so um, I'm, I, I think it's important in these conversations that we become honest. Part of learning our history, part of writing a memoir is about being honest. And the honesty isn't necessarily from black people. We know what's up. Uh, the honesty is from other communities, white folks too, but I'm talking about non-black communities about um, uh, what we live inside of, what kind of sickness we live inside of, and how you benefit from that sickness. Mm. The only people that don't benefit are black people. And so um, part of the reckoning is um, it has to be, the fight for reparations can't be just black people fighting for it. It literally has to be a fight for all of us and a recognition that if we actually win, black people that is, everybody else wins. Mm. Like mm. point blank period. And if we don't embody that, if we don't embody that, we're going to fall short time and time again. And so, to me, the, the piece about reparations is um, it's a cultural shift. And it's a shift that has to happen not just inside the states, it's a shift that has to happen globally. Thank you, Patrice.
Let me, let me share with you, because I know you're emotional, so let me just tell you how much you just called forward one of our greatest ancestors, Audre Lorde, who wrote the line, if we lose, black women's blood will congeal upon a dead planet, but if we win, there is no telling. That's the energy you just called forward. Thank you. And Kenny, I want you to hold space for and think about, you know, all of the people who we have sent to prison since 1970, 71. And what has been taken, the lives that have been changed, lost, disjointed, dismembered. Um, you know, one of the hardest things when you know people who are in prison and, um, and when you love people who are in prison is to be with them when they lose one of their parents or one of their children, you know. Um, and I've been through enough with a number of people and walked with prisoners to their parents' deathbed. Um, and you know that when you have 2.2 million people in prison, you're never talking about anything that's an act of personal failure, that's a policy decision. And how do we repair the harm for that? I, um, um, I, I really wish I could sit up here and give y'all a real, um, palatable, uh, uh, acceptable uh, answer to that question, but in being honest, you know, I look at how people that have suffered in prison and how we have allowed a society that has caused us and took so much from us that we didn't even support our own to where a Dorothy Gaines is there who I have to draw strength off. I have to draw strength off of a Asha Bandele and hold Patrice hand so I don't start cussing everybody out. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out this reparations thing in the way, in the context that y'all put it, Ira Carruthers and, 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 and Deborah Smalls, but I'm also looking at the damage that was done to our family so much that we allowed them to lock us up and even we let them do it and didn't keep up with the visits and didn't keep up with the, the phone calls and didn't keep up with the letters that would keep them from violating us knowing that somebody can. So I'm trying to figure out, Asha, how in the hell I be politically correct up here and answering your question when there's no way in the hell that my family has been taken away from me where I have to depend on you and everybody else because it wasn't politically correct or acceptable for them to even have anything to do with me because of me being in prison. So when we talk about reparations, how do they pay for that, Ira? How do they pay for the part that kept even people who I should have been dependent upon not even able to be there for me? because they would have fell into the same white supremacist society as not being acceptable themselves. Mm -hmm. Jean, Jean and I see you, Cassandra. We're gonna come to you, baby. <laughs> But you know, I can, I, you know, I really do remember the moment that we were on a panel and you talked about feeling as though you had been exiled based on American policies that were exported around the world. 
and we, you know, Deborah and I have often talked about the Philippines being the natural, vulgar outgrowth, right? 10,000 people killed in two years of American drug policies. But it's almost like Panama was one of the testing grounds. And I, and I wonder if you can talk about a bit what one might imagine you do when you've decided to disrupt an entire country. And I want to say this in a certain context. It was interesting. Last year, I, I took my daughter to Guyana, where her father had been deported to. And Guyana is what we call a pass-through country. So there's very little drug use on the ground in Guyana, but when they arrested like the, the one guy, literally, who was a kingpin, it disrupted the entire economy because he bought, like, had all the businesses, he had, you know, all of this stuff. He employed people. We saw that in Jamaica when they uh, arrested Dudas, right? Because he built, he built hospitals and he, and he kept the police from coming in, in Tivoli Gardens, right? And so it's, you know, it's a different thing that you experience in another country. And while we even here talk about how horrible kingpins are, which in many cases they are, there's also this other piece when people are manipulating the economy of your country. And I wonder if you would pull that apart and what it means to live in a land that uh, not your choice. Although you do get to live in the same city as me now. And Nisa. But not from Brooklyn. No, that's not, I didn't <laughs> say, you yeah, gotta get into all the details. <laughs> um, so this is, this is, I don't usually talk about this, the invasion a lot. Um, but I'm more and more, I'm, I'm speaking more about it because it's very traumatic, right? Mm -hmm. To live through um, a process of invasion because invasion doesn't start the day that the U.S. invades. I come from a family, a lineage of activists, very proud people in Panama. My dad was anti-military bases from, he was a teenager, were descendants from Jamaica that were forced to migrate to, to Panama. So I'm a third generation Panamanian. Doesn't mean that much when you're black though. Um, just keeping that real because people have this illusion that we all belong and there's no racism in Latin America, which is not true. Um, so the same way that we're criminalized here, we've been criminalized there. Um, Non-black people got citizenship before black people did. I still have my grandmother's um, non-citizenship card that she could use to open a bank account, but that didn't ensure that she could vote, mm. right? And children couldn't speak Spanish, sorry, children couldn't speak English outside of their households, even though they were born there. But if you came from Barbados, Grenada, Jamaica, you were punished for speaking English outside of your household. So that's the, that's the context in the you know, early 1900s, 19, up to like 1940s, 1950s. So, and we, I'm a mother, right? And I keep that in mind too. beautiful children. Of beautiful, delicious children that will never know Panama the way that I grew up in. And that's very hard for me because they, I was uprooted against my will when I was a teenager to move to Canada under certain conditions. And then I, you know, I had to go back to Panama and then I, I finally, I, I got here and I had children here, but they will never know what it is growing up in Panama. And I resent living in the United States and it's a daily existence that I have to challenge myself against. But here I am. Um, 1989, the US invaded Panama after, as you spoke earlier on, you know, it was a long, it was a long history, but you know, let's let's go back to Reagan and, and Bush, right? And um, what what they did was that they were forcing um, Noriega to take a stance against left insurgency throughout the region, right? Specifically, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and they were funding 
um, they were channeling arms, right, into the region. And when Noriega said, well, slow your horses here because I'm not, I'm not down with, them, with this, then they started claiming that Panama was like the center of this dr massive drug trade and trafficking. Um, and then Noriega passed from being a peace builder with them mm -hmm. into being an enemy. And they had to invade Panama under national security to make sure that drug trafficking was halted and delayed into the United States. And because Panama was then going to threaten the Panama yeah. Canal, which was their biggest investment in the region, which is ridiculous, we're a small little country. But what happens, and this is where, this is where folks don't always know the history, the first bombs from the US were specifically targeted to a black community, which mm. is El Chorrillo. That community has never been able to rebuild. And that's a community today that has the highest incarceration rates, the highest, the highest um, you know, drug addiction right, rates, less access to health care, less access to education. It's still a forgotten community. And this is where black people live. Mm. So this is a, you know, this is the, this is the, the unspoken, and a lot of us know this history, right? This is not, for, the, for, for black activists here, I understand now as an adult that there is black um, resistance to this military invasion into Panama. But we didn't get that information when I was a teenager. I was 14, 15 at the time. Um, so the, this, is how, this is how destabilizing U.S. foreign policy is in, in the region. And this is, Panama is one example. There's also Nicaragua. You know, they have 40% of Nicaragua. Most people don't know this. is autonomous land. And that's a threat to the U.S. interests mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they control the natural resources for the whole country. Mm. So that's coming. That's in the plan there. But then we have Colombia which is the second largest internally displaced community mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. because of this war on drugs that the U.S. is funding and funneling Tell over me. and over again. And it's not, even, it's not even only on the ground now. It's aerial warfare where, people, where the U.S. is fumigating people's land. Mm. And Colombia is, is one, the only country that has you know, it recognizes black Afro-descendant communities and it allocates land to them. And that's a threat to the United States. Mm -hmm. So in order to control this and for this population to be destabilized, they fumigate under the, the threat of illicit crops again, which is a minority in this land, but it kills all their ava the, abil the ability to grow crops to sustain their families mm. independently, sustainably like they have throughout the, the decades and decades that they've been there, this, the, the hundreds of years that they've existed as communities. And then that suddenly opens up, you know, spaces for, you know, Monsanto to come in and all these transnational corporations from Europe, Canada, and United States to destabilize this whole community and economy, and then they end up living in the streets in Bogota. Okay, that's what happens. So how do we, how, how can we not, you know, and, and when I talk to this, especially a lot of, to black folks in the, in the context of the United States, most people don't even know that this is happening. And that we are contributing to this. And I have to say we, unfortunately, because I live and it exists right here in this country. And if we, can, if we, if we talk about, about land and reparations in the United States, then we also have to talk about land and reparations throughout the world and Come the on. region. Come on. Right. Let, me, let me bring, let me bring um, Cassandra into this because some of the ways that we may be able to think about it internationally may also start with how we think about it right here. And I want to be completely authentic, right, in this conversation. Cassandra is working very hard to move a marijuana legalization campaign here in, uh, I'm sorry, in New York, in New York. 
Zero is all, and it's gonna win. We're gonna get it. We're gonna get it. And last year when Lynn Lyman led Proposition 64 along with all of our partners from A New Way of Life and from all of us that are not, just across the region in California, she said because it included $50 million in reparations. And Glenn Backus, I don't know if he's here, but went in there and fought for that. I see you, Kat. I see you, Kat, our new LA, our new LA marijuana czar came out of that campaign. But what Lynn said then, and she said continually through the discussion, was that we've set a new floor, not a new ceiling. Mm -hmm. right, right. And so Cassandra began to get us up off of that floor. She began to think about the campaign here in New York. There are those who agree with us that we should legalize marijuana. Where we part is how we do it. Because there's so many things that there are those in this movement who would leave off the table in order to advance marijuana legalization, perhaps before funders to say we got to win. I don't know, maybe. And I feel like as a movement, we need to say something about that. Does marijuana legalization mean anything? if it excludes the very people that it's mostly supposed to help. And so I want you to talk about Cassandra and make your damn case here for the people who are taking what I believe to be a vulgar position Make your case why reparations must be pivotal. Pookie must be central if we are talking about marijuana legalization in our work. And if anybody is not doing that, why they are not doing the work they say that they're committed to. Thank you, Asha. Look how her voice sounds all gentle. You know that's not real. That's all. That's some fake shit right there. Come on. I thank you, Asha. <laughs> Ain't nobody believe that. Ain't nobody believe that. I know. <laughs> Did you just call me a perpetrator? <laughs> so, I really struggle with this question. And I struggle with it because Michelle Alexander yesterday called our movement out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. She called our movement out because it has become more fundable to say that the work we do around drug policy is racial justice work. But as she eloquently stated yesterday, when you scratch the surface, you realize how shallow that is that what people think is racial justice work is acknowledging and highlighting racial disparities in enforcement. Mm -hmm. And that is, to me, what I fear about the conversation about reparations. I say that because there are people that build campaigns, criminal justice campaigns, economic justice campaigns, drug policy campaigns, that are quick to cite racial disparities, and yet nothing in their policies do anything to disrupt the way that state violence and their actors affect women, trans people, communities of color, black folk, but are very quick to say they do racial justice work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We even see that in the way that people are building their marijuana legalization campaigns. 
Everyone can quote the way that racial disparities and disproportionate enforcement affects communities of color as a talking point for their marijuana legalization campaign. This is now just standard. And I want to acknowledge that that is because of the work of folks in this room. That's because of folks like Deborah Peterson Small. That's because of work like Harry Levine. But we've taken advantage of that. And we thought that that's where we needed to stop. Because people are building whole campaigns around racial justice without doing a damn thing for black people. Without having black people in the leadership, with not being accountable to black communities. You have people having full on conversations about racial justice. But see, here's the thing about reparations and the conversation about reparations. It is not new. ta Coates' essay is not the first time we had a conversation about reparations. But that's the first time that a lot of white liberals thought that it was acceptable to have a conversation about reparations. I know people at Drug Policy Alliance that were not down with the conversation about reparations, but because Michelle Alexander made the point about it, they were like, oh, this this makes sense and that was confusing to me because I thought when I described to you what it meant to be snatched from West Africa to be plopped down in the Caribbean to be invaded by the United States that that was enough for you to realize that my life that my humanity needed repair but it was not it wasn't until someone said, well, you arrested all these people for marijuana, and now only the white people are making money off of it. This might be a problem. But if you never understood why reparations in general around black people was important, then the conversation about reparations and marijuana is fake. It is an insult. You cannot have a conversation about reparations and the drug war if we don't talk about the armed conflict, which was the snatching of black bodies on the continent of Africa. You can't have a conversation about reparations if you haven't been paying attention to the work that the Institute of the Black World has been doing that has created a 10-point plan. You can't have a conversation about reparations if you are connecting it only to a goddamn plant. Because a plant will not legalize black people. And $50 million in California is great, but it is not going to recognize what the decimation of Patrice's life was look like. It does not recognize the decimation of my freaking culture. When we talk about why white liberals are scared it's not because they don't understand. It's because they realize they have to give something up. People don't want to give anything up. For you to repair the harms, you got to give something up. You have to give up your, you have to give up your arrogance. You got to lay down the sacrifice. You have to give up your leadership. They don't want to do that. Because the conversation stops because people say, I didn't do that. But you sure do benefit from it. So the conversation about reparations and marijuana legalization to me is shallow. Because you cannot repair the harms based of marijuana prohibition if you don't want to repair the harms associated with why I'm on this fucking continent in the first place. So I 
I think I was right in my description. <laughs> and she still got the face on. But there it is. And I want to ask what could be included realistically in legislative proposals. And I do want to put it in that because we do policy. And so what is a deal breaker, right? What is a deal breaker? What are our common threads? And so either one of these questions in the speed round, let's answer, and then, is that, are those fair? Yeah, fair. And then we'll go to the audience, who I'm sure has a bunch of brilliant questions. Ira, let's start with you. Well, you know, the problem with uh, answering what kind of things that we want to have in legislation is that if Cassandra is right, that we can't really address those problems without addressing much larger problems, then the question about legislation that might be able to pass and make some difference gets to be a much smaller and predicate question. And uh, I, I actually don't think we're ready yet there. I mean, there are things that could be done because one of the consequences of everything we've been talking about, and not just the drug war, but our whole history, is that when you look at the statistics about relative incomes, you see a lot of progress between white family income and black family income over the last 30 years, but you don't see much progress with respect to wealth and assets. Right, that's right. Now, there's a reason for that, and it is not accidental. It was policy driven. There were, there were reasons why if you supply people with a little bit of subsistence income, they can never accumulate assets. There were policy reasons like the tax code in which you get a deduction for real estate taxes if you own a house and mortgage interest if you're paying a mortgage but you don't get any deductions if you're paying rent. Mm. Even though the rent includes money that goes to the landlord that's used to pay interest on mortgage and real estate taxes. Mm -hmm. There, you know, in order to really unpack the layered and complex ways in which Racial stratification and subjugation have been institutionalized structurally in this country. You have to unpack all of those details. Yes. You have to talk about creating new wealth. You have to talk about creating asset accounts, not welfare payments. You have to talk about more than just making it look like the current generation is operating more equally. Right. Thank you, Ira. The two questions before you in the speed round before we go to the audience um, are these. What examples are there, if any, of, any, of a successful reparation campaign that we've seen in this nation that we could learn from and that we want to draw from? Or what do you say has to be included in any legislative proposals going forward. And by that, let me be clear, we made certain decisions when this movement first really started addressing in a very deep way uh, racial inequities and racial discrimination in the drug laws, right? We called them racial impact statements, right? So there are ways to begin to look at this. I don't think they're a cure-all, but there are ways. But are there deal breakers? Are there things that our movement is just too damn good to do? That we say that that's a fair, like we said in Ohio. Like we said in Ohio with the marijuana legislative push in Ohio. So looking at that from a legislative perspective, one of the first things that we got to do, and I'm gaining my energy off you, Ron, so that's why I'm looking at you so hard. And I'm, I'm quite sure you know, if don't nobody else know, I pull off Ron Daniel. The first thing we got to look at, if you really want to attach something that's pertaining to reparations to marijuana and the drug law and all this, you got to look at the 13th Amendment and that exception clause. 
That's first and foremost. Because that would be the closest thing to looking at starting to repair all the free labor that they have taken from us when you look at the black codes, the slave codes that come into the exception clause. And then let's look at the fact that each and every one of these prisons are actually the plantations that existed before there was an emancipation, a proclamation, or the bullshit they call it thereof, and that's when prisons came into effect. So that would be the first piece of legislation that we even have to look at. Repeal the 13th we, Amendment. Exactly. Or amend the, the 13th exception. Amendment. Thank you. Patrice? To ask you, are there any reparations campaigns that you want to lift up that have happened in our current history in this nation that we can learn from? Or is there anything that you would say is a deal breaker in any legislative proposal that we put forward? Yeah. Um, I mean, the one campaign that I've been looking at and talking to folks about for a minute is the Chicago reparations campaign. Yes. Um, and. Um, Folks can, it's so searchable, you can look up the ordinance, but it's a couple things. One of them is an actual fund for torture survivors of John Burge, um, which I think is huge. And I think black people uh, across the globe have, um, uh, have claimed to being tortured by local governments. And I think we should actually really think about what, what it could look like to launch uh, local reparations campaigns. Um, and the other thing that I, I really appreciate about the, this reparations campaign is they built a, a Chicago Torture Justice Center um, specifically for victims who were tortured by the police, um, the first ever of its kind to specifically talk about state violence and its impact on black communities. Um, I think it's really important because they also talk about not just the people who are tortured, but the impact that torture had on the family members and the community those people came from. And so um, I, I would, you know, for folks that don't know the campaign, study it. For people who are thinking about what kinds of conversations they can have locally, I would say study it. Um, and for people who are thinking about campaigns, um, I, I would say that this could be a really interesting campaign to do locally. Thank you, Patrice. jean -Viev. Um, I, <laughs> mine is pretty simple. Um, because I'm looking also at, I'm looking also at the global piece, right? Specifically in, in Latin America, is get the hell out of there, number one. Mm. U.S., get the <laughs> fuck out! You have, get out. So, and that means us over here knowing what free trades are, and what free trades are being passed, that we don't even know about that is only benefiting United States, but not really benefiting all of the United States because it really doesn't benefit black folk, right, here. And, you know, and I say this because in, in most of the countries where there has been military bases and military invasions, we have our own truth and reconciliation process. Yes. So U.S., you don't have anything to do in there. So get out, let the organizers <laughs> over there have their process to then hold you accountable because that's also part of the process. Those that invaded us and destabilized us will be held accountable, but we have our own processes. So the first thing for me would be, you know, get out. Um, the second piece is for the, for the folks over here to really know what policies you're supporting and by your silence you are supporting them. <laughs> and how modern day slavery from Latin America is impacting us here and how we're benefiting from it. The diabetes crisis that is happening here in the United States, most of the workers in Colombia, all the workers in Colombia that process sugar, not only for, for sugar cane, but also for the green energy that's not really green, is all black labor. So our silence is costing people here diabetes. So those little sugar packs that you see out there, most of them don't come from the United States. They come from black sweat over there. And those people are not paid for that. They're held captive pretty much. Exactly. You know, it's interesting in um, South Africa where we love our wines to come from, they <laughs> has the highest incidence of fetal alcohol syndrome because they used to pay the women who worked the vineyards in bottles of wine and not in one dime yeah. to live. And, and find that, out where your gold is coming right. from, <laughs> right? Because a lot of it is also coming from Colombia and from yeah. Latin America. 
Dr. Ivor, the same two questions to you and then to you, Cassandra, and then I want to bring it out here. So I would just add to the conversation by suggesting that we have to pay uh, very, very serious attention to reparatory justice as it relates to education and to create um, the capacity to build centers of education that will allow for us to do the kind of truth telling so that our people are part of a process of restoring their mind. Um, and by way of extension, when we hear the pain that's been expressed here, we understand the extent to which we have been traumatized. And there is a need for us to do the internal healing that we have to do in order for us to move forward. And so I think it's very, very critical that we pay attention to how we create and make non-negotiable the capacity building to do the education that we have to do. Thank you, Dr. Iva. And Cassandra? So quickly, I would say, I, I mean, I think to your point, Ira, I do think that there are legislative things that we can do. I just think it needs to be um, situated in a larger context. And to that, I would say any policy that has to do with marijuana legalization that bars people with um, criminal justice histories from being a part of um, the business or anything associated with the regulated market is not a marijuana policy that we should ever support. That's I think right. any policy that does not strategically and intentionally intentionally make sure that communities that have been most harmed by marijuana prohibition are a, are a part of the licensing and the ownership. I think it's really crazy that people out here in the marijuana industry are trying to give Pookie internships in a business that he's already been a right. part of. I think we need to have conversations about making sure that any policy that we are doing anything around marijuana legalization also takes into account the way that child welfare systems treat marijuana. It's not just legislatively, it's also administratively. There are a lot of social workers doing a lot of damages in hospitals, in um, treatment facilities all over the place. And I think it's super important that it's not only um, necessary that um, the impact of marijuana prohibition around women is centered and about people that have been harmed by the um, justice system, by people that are um, incarcerated, currently formerly incarcerated. Any bill that does not get people out of jail or prison in, within six months of that bill being passed is problematic. Anything that does not do what my colleagues in California did as soon as that law was passed, that people can get their records sealed at that very moment is unacceptable. Thank you. So I know there are questions in the audience. We've been given 15 minutes grace. Please be gentle, ask a question, or make a 30-second comment. Hi, my name is Tiffany Johnson from Los Angeles. I'm the Associate Director of A New Way of Life for Entry. Woo! And I, I wanted to bring into the conversation, since we're talking about reparations, when we talk about reparations, are we looking all the way back to history when slavery was in, when we were enslaved and our women was raped and tortured and we had these children who was raped and tortured that is still happening today. As a formerly incarcerated woman, I went into incarceration due to being raped from a white man for a period of years. Where's the reparation in that? And I am not alone. So when we bring into this conversation, I must add, ask you to really think about what is happening to our babies that is systematically taking them to a, a traumatic state that is leading them into incarceration and into the streets. What are we gonna do about that? Thank you. Dr. Ivy, you wanna take that? Oh. Oh, yes, I didn't know if you were going to do other questions. So, absolutely. I mean, this we cannot uh, look at this in a silo in terms of a narrow view of drug policy. And when we're talking about reparations, first of all, I think this panel has represented that it's a global issue and that there are global assumptions that drive and have driven the claim that we have. And so, you know, H.R. 40, which John Conyers sponsored and has sponsored subsequently every year, began with the question of studying the lingering effects 
of the transatlantic slave, slave, slave trade, but that new bill that he has proposed through a collaborative process from the ground up of all of us sharing in the documentation that essentially said we've already studied it. It is now time for us to assume reparations and then begin to make that claim in a way that we can develop proposals for such. And that has to go back to the point of the snatch. It has to go back to the point of the rape. And we are obligated, based on the blood and the soil, to speak to that. And so the answer to your question is yes. And there are very specific 10-point programs coming out of CARICOM representing the heads of states of the Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. as well as the National African American Reparations Commission, which has a 10-point program, all which has identified the various sectors from the taking of our art and culture to health, to education, to issues of law, etc. And so we only have to do the work of making sure that we create the infrastructure by which we can do this, hold one another accountable, and move this agenda. Thank generation you. by generation. Thank and you. I want to say thank you, young people, for having the audacious courage to stay here and be a part of this movement. Thank you, Dr. Ivor. Hello, my name is Frederica, and I don't have a question. I actually have a statement, and I too, like Dr. Harper, want to thank everyone here because I woke up this morning literally, and I didn't know anything about international drug policy. Mm. I woke up, and I prayed, and I said, God, order my steps. Mm. And as I went online, and I started doing research because I said, something's not right. Me and my husband have been fighting for years against public corruption due to discrimination, due to race, due to a history of drug and addiction. My husband was discriminated against because of his history and people went in and changed his medical records literally. So what I want to say is I do need help. We have been fighting. We've called hundreds of attorneys and we can't get any help. So I went online this morning. I was invited down. So if anyone knows anything that can help us, we are reaching out to you. And I want to thank everybody in this room for what you're doing and what you stand for. Thank you. There were, there were two very powerful points made tonight. One is that truth telling is needed. And the other point is that you can't repair this, but you have to reckon with it. So I'd like to ask the panel, what is to be learned from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa? And what's to be learned from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission with regards to residential schools in Canada? And what are we doing with regards to truth and reconciliation and reparations for indigenous people? Thank you so much. Does anybody want to take that? Well, I, I think one of the things uh, that, that, that has been learned from the Truth and Reconciliation progress, uh, process in South Africa is the need uh, for people who benefited from the subjugation to understand it and cop to it. Um, I think we are still a long way from that. Uh, the the um, you know, I, I spent the better part of my whole life fighting against racial subjugation and discrimination in this country. And it was not until about two-thirds of the way through that that I actually learned how I benefited from all the subjugation I was fighting against. How I was what I came to see as I struggled even to find a word for it. And the phrase I finally found was that I was the unjust beneficiary of racial subjugation. How? My father was a construction worker with a fifth grade education. He grew up during the Depression. 
he had trouble getting a job during the years that I was an infant. He had a job in New York City. Not full time all the time, but he was employed. We made it. Why did he have a job? He had a job because in order to get a construction job in New York City in those years, you had to be the, a member of a labor union carpenter, electrician, a glazier, a bricklayer, a plasterer. Labor unions did not admit black folks. When I grew up, that was normal. You know, I grew up in a kind of a liberal New Deal household. I went with my father from time to time to the labor union hiring hall. I never saw anybody black but I never noticed it because it was normal. And then what happened is because my father had a job, he accumulated enough money to put a down payment in 1950 on a house in the suburbs. And he was able to get an FHA mortgage. And it wasn't until years later that I came to understand that black folks in exactly his situation couldn't get an FHA mortgage. So everything that I had, I owed to the fact that he, and therefore I, was an unjust beneficiary of the discrimination that I thought I hated. Mm. So I, I think that part of the truth and reconciliation process is that you have to begin to engage people in, in that kind of understanding and concession and copying to the ways in which they have benefited, which I know from enough arguments with white folks, we are a long way from there yet, and we have to get there. Thank you, Ira. Art Cribs, Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity in Los Angeles. I want to direct my question to Dr. Carruthers. Uh, Namibia, a uh, country of 2.2 million people, is in the process of filing a $300 billion uh, reparations lawsuit against Germany for a century of genocidal activities there. One, how do you quantify um, a, a price for the kind of reparations we're talking about tonight that covers not only centuries but uh, regions of the world? And how do you prosecute uh, toward a resolve outside the United States because you don't go to the person who has created the harm and then work out a deal. So where would you take this case and how would you quantify to come up with an amount and what is the region, what is the time span to begin to enter that process? Thank you. Dr. Iva? Okay, that's about 10 questions. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but let me first suggest very simply what my grandmother said, whatever they pay you, they owe you some more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you cannot really quantify the damage that has been done. But what we can do is we can rely on the economists such as Sir Hillary Beckles, who can go in a room and figure out based on the various uh, notions of what we know to be the value of our labor, the things that were stolen and put some numbers to that, right? And then we can make our case. But remember now that part of making the case, and you know better than I, in terms of the international courts, has to meet a certain standard. And part of the reason the United States did not want to participate in Durban and they did not want for us to claim that this had been a crime against humanity, once again, not acknowledging our humanity is because that allows us to make a claim in the international courts. But let's be reminded that the very reason Burge spent time in jail, I'm from Chicago, is because we argued that at the United Nations. And it was mm. only through dogged tenacity and capacity to figure out where the spaces were that allowed us to step into the necessity to quantify, to understand there will never be enough, 
to figure out how to create the institutions that can help us to repair. But let's be real clear. Bishop Tutu even said that the failure of the truth and reconciliation process was that it was treated like a flyover. Mm -hmm. Those are my words, flyover. You cannot get to reconciliation until you get to transformation. And South <clears throat> African society has not been transformed. And until we move towards really adjusting and dealing with what you have said, we will never get there. And so the question is not whether we're going to stop making the demand. And the question is not our humanity. The question is, will people find their humanity by acquiescing to our demands? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Iva. We have literally one minute left. I'm not, but here, and I want to say this, these, these rooms are meant to open up discussions that you continue to have. I wish every question could be answered here and we walked away and the world was right and set back on its axis. Yeah. We don't, and I'm sorry I can't get to every question, though deeply grateful to all of you who have allowed us to stay longer and those of you who did, I know that it's late, but this is the last question and we're gonna say good night in this remaining one minute. Uh -huh. So uh, I'm a lawyer from India and I, I, I don't fully understand, but like Asha said, this is about courage, so I will uh, you know, have the courage to ask. Um, in India, we have what you describe racial discrimination. We have caste-based discrimination where people who are born into a certain family are, yes, yes, uh, treated with. So in our constitution, we have a framework of affirmative action, which really focuses on the areas of education and employment. And there's a lot of literature, uh, you know, political, legal, economic about that. So maybe that's something you can look at. And the other comment that I have is that there's another community now which is subjected to mistrust and animosity and insecurity, and that is our Muslim brothers and sisters. And I understand that a lot of Africans are also pra uh, practicing Muslims. So how do you, you know, this sense of uh, what you described today, how do we make sure that that doesn't now wheel up another community which is and it's happening all over. It's not just happening in the US, it's happening back home in India, Europe, lots of other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And, and maybe, Cassandra, you know, it's good to talk about the work that we do here and what it is that we can take on. Because I think that what we're trying to do within, in, in this space, is consider the, the policies that we're accountable for. We take money every day and these jobs, that would, this is the people's money. People would be paying this in taxes. They don't pay taxes, so they do philanthropy. That'd be going into the public, you know what I mean? But we take that money, and so we're accountable to a particular mission and work that we're gonna do in the good. And so my own sense, you tell me if, if you agree, is that what we might like to do for those of us who work in drug policy is do like what happened in Chicago and begin to create a model that others can take on and replicate in other areas of, of replication. And just, I'm sorry, I took some of that. So this is really the last, and yeah. 10 yeah. seconds. So I would say, I think to your point, I think part of the structure of the way to um, have a conversation about reparations is breaking up into three, acknowledge, and that is taking an account of what is happening in, in various ways. Like what are the different systems that are impacting someone's life? Atoning, creating a, a, converse, a space for conversation, for reckoning, for atonement, for recognition, accountability, and action. How can we make sure that this doesn't happen again? And I think that you can take that model throughout any community and figure out what's happening. That's right. um, and that's essentially what we're trying to do in New York in trying to figure out how can we actually use this, the, uh, the drug war, an issue of armed conflict in communities to create a process in which we can acknowledge what is happening, how we can atone for it, and how we can put in some action. Thank you so much. Come on, the mic, I got this mic. <laughs>